Lesson B3, Cultural Status and Variation. America as a whole is a melting pot, with many different ethnic groups influencing the overall culture. But within any one cultural group, there are important differences. Expected norms differ depending on the situation and a person's status, and as a culture changes, some groups or aspects of society may diverge from the dominant culture. Sagging your pants may be normal fashion for a young person, while an older person may see such behavior as sloppy. A wealthy person may drink cocktails at a golf game, while a working class person may prefer beer at a football game. Women traditionally wear dresses, while many would consider a man doing the same quite deviant. Cultural norms of costume, behavior, and even values depend largely on a person's position in society, their status. When people understand you as an accountant, they will expect you to play very different roles than if they understand your status as a waiter. Status labels and the role behaviors associated with them are social constructions. There is no more practical reason to wear a tie as an accountant than as a waiter, and yet the Thomas theorem states that if we value a tie as more professional, then more professional statuses will require one. Expected norms also change depending on the situation, as when you're out with your friends, you're not in your professional role. But of course, those are just job positions, one of many statuses an individual has in their status set. Other statuses, though, can master a person's life and opportunities. The roles associated with men and women, our gender roles, in our culture are traditionally so different that a famous book said, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And many men and women tend to fulfill the expectations of their gender status. Men's values and even skills often have what's called an instrumental orientation, focused on competition and technical thinking, while women may have an expressive orientation, focused more on cooperation and emotional concerns. These form some of the basis for our culture's ideas of masculine and feminine. And sociobiologists would argue that some of these differences are based on genetics and biology. After all, males and females do have slightly different DNA and clear anatomical differences. So is gender merely a matter of nature, or does society's nurture play a role? Most people are identified at or before birth by their genitalia as male or female. While for some, these primary sex characteristics aren't as obvious, and it is often doctors that decide the status of intersex babies. But at puberty, secondary sex characteristics generally make biological sex more obvious. Not every adult male has more facial hair than every female, and not all females have bigger breasts than males, yet these traits are common enough to become expected and are more genetically distinct than biological racial stereotypes. Yet many of the stereotypes of men and women are social constructions. It is our culture that labels young males and females boys and girls, and adults, men and women. This is our status, our gender. Sociobiology points out that as females alone are capable of giving birth, and in pre-industrial societies there were few reliable options for birth control and bottle feeding, our anatomy led to women spending more time around the home with children, while males, being slightly larger on average, could go farther from home to hunt and do battle. Functionalists might say that those basic adaptations for survival led most societies to construct separate statuses for different norms of behavior. Over time, these became expected traditions, and deviating from gender roles caused many individuals to be judged and sometimes sanctioned harshly. Just as some do not identify with their particular racial or ethnic group, gender identity and role behaviors vary greatly, and our culture has begun to reflect that. Those born female who feel they fit society's roles as a woman, we call cisgender women, or in the opposite case, cisgender men. Those who do not feel that their biological sex matches their own gender identity may consider themselves transgender. But there are many more subtle ways that people exist between the extremes of cultural gender roles, including clothing choice, interests, who you're attracted to, your feelings towards children, and others beyond count. Many cultures recognize this by having more than two possible gender statuses. Like race and ethnicity, many people use biological sex and gender terms interchangeably. But some cultures are beginning to allow official status of sex to remain unspecified or other. 
Even for the two most common gender statuses, cultures have different norms for many role expectations. Ethnocentrism leads to culture shock when we see people deviating from our culture's norms, as in these Wodabi men. Yet, our culture's gender norms have changed greatly in the last hundred years. Diffusion of norms from other cultures open up more possibilities for both genders. Innovations like birth control and milk formula free women from female reproductive needs, which allows new discoveries of how capable both sexes can be in each other's gender roles.